don't know me yet. Of course, my name is Terry Nelson. I grew up on a ranch in South Texas. My father was a foreman, not the owner. It's about 88,000 acres, so I had a little bit of freedom when I was a kid. I left home when I was 17 because I was smarter than my dad. Found out six months later that I wasn't. <laughs> uh, but uh, they were hiring in Vietnam in those days, so I got a job in no trouble. Spent four years, well, almost five years in the military. Got a medical discharge out of uh, Southeast Asia in 1972. Not enough that it kept me from getting other jobs, of course, but uh, coming back to haunt me now as I get older. Then I went to work for the railroad. I was an engineer, a uh, telegraphy clerk, and they closed all the stations and they offered me a job as an engineer on the railroad, as a fireman training, engineer training. They, and they laid lots of money. About the same time I got a a notice of my acceptance for Border Patrol. I go, lots of fun, lots of money. Mm -hmm. I took the fun, you know. Okay. <laughs> I never regretted it. I really enjoyed it. I had a good career. Worked for them for nine years. Uh, went to the academy and taught uh, six sessions of the academy. Came back out, moved from El Paso to Florida, where I worked in eight counties area in central Florida, working uh, immigrants working in the fields and smuggling, coming back and forth between Mexico and there, and basically a slave trading of the Mexican people. Because they would bring them in, put them in shacks and charge them two bucks a day for living in, in a cockroach infested trailer. Can of took 15 and take them to work every morning and charge them 50 cents to work and 50 cents back. You know, basically indentured servants is what they were. And if you arrested them, sent them back to Mexico, they would refuse to pay them. But they would go to Mexico and pick them up and bring them back. They'd be gone in more than three days when we shipped them back. They'd be back within, within a week, they'd be back. That's frustrating. So then they offered me a job working narcotics down in Florida Keys. Actually, I met the district director. He said, we have an opening in Key West. And I said, how about Marathon? I've been in Marathon. I like it. I'll go there. We don't have a station there. I said, you're the district director. Make one. And he said, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of laughed. Well, a week later, I got a call saying that if I wanted a job, I could have a job in Marathon. Amazing. So I went to work. Um, I'm going to tell you this because I'm going to show you the corruption angle and then I'll get on to my presentation. I've been working about six months. And I was at a big party one at, a, at Doctor's Island, but the rich people owned an island off the coast of Marathon. And I was invited for New Year's Day dinner. I thought, this is really nice. You know, I'm invited in a local Gustavo out for dinner. I went out and had a wonderful lunch. Sitting there, we're waiting for sunset in the evening, having champagne. It's really cool. I'm chatting up a real estate agent. Things are cool. Looking, looking real good. And some guy calls up and says, are you Nelson? Said, yes. He said, do you mind coming back with me? We'd like to talk to you. Said, okay. So I get up and wander back. <coughs> Open up a bed, what looked like a bedroom, but it wasn't. It was a big round table with seven chairs. Six people, six of them were occupied. They said, have a seat. So I sat down. And I looked around the table, nobody introduced themselves or anything. They said, so what's it going to be? I go, well, that's pretty obvious. I go, well, there's a new sheriff in town, boys. I'm not going to be, you're not, you can't be able to bribe me. I'm not going to, I'm not for hire. I said, so if I arrest you, I'll arrest you, but I don't do it. It's not personal for me. I'll drink a beer with you tomorrow. But if you break the law, you're going to get arrested. And I walked out of that, and I needless to say, I went ahead and went back to the, the main one because I thought, I have never imagined that they would just say, you're for hire. Well, I found out several months later why it was, because half the people in the Keys were for hire. But they just, drugs corrupt everything they touch. And that's when I first started learning that. I worked there three years, and one day I just had enough, because I thought I was going to be killed. One I'm of surprised our agents, you the first day. Well, one of our agents <laughs> ripped off a load. And it was my load that I'd worked on. If it came in a different place than it was supposed to, we get out there, and there's 10 bales missing off the load, it's obvious, because of the way they were stacked in the boat. And he did it. I know he did it, because the way he was acting when I got there. But I didn't have the guts to go check the vehicle, and he drives off. But I get a phone call from him an hour later, after we seized the boat, took it all around the Coast Guard station for processing. You get a phone call. I'm in, a, in the Coast Guard office, and the guy says, uh, are you Nelson? Yeah. He goes, someone's on the phone for you. I said, who? He said, I don't know. I didn't recognize the voice. So I go over and say, hello. And I recognize the voice. And this guy should have too. <laughs> you know? And he says, well, we need to talk. Meet me down in the parking lot. I go, 
Okay? Now he knows I'm on to him, and he's either going to cut me in or shoot me. One of those two things is going to happen. So I got my gun, put it in my pocket, my blazer, cocked it, and walked down the stairs. Walked up to the door of the car, and I said, if he comes up with a gun, I'm going to shoot him first. That's the only thing I can do. And I, just as I'm walking towards the car, and he had his hand on the steering wheel, he didn't have them in his pocket, in his, in his seat. Another, our supervisor come around the corner right behind him, the lights lit up every hand. And he said, who's that? I said, it looks like Kenny, which was my supervisor. And we never had our conversation. So I never knew what he was going to ask me or offer me. Going back that night, I'm talking with a partner. He said, did you see what I saw? I said, man, don't even go there with me. You guys work together in Panama. All of you guys know each other. You've been working together for 10 years. I'm the outsider here. You know what I think. He said, yeah, I did look a little strange. He said, well, what are we going to do about it? He said, I'm going to tell the supervisor. That's what I'm going to do about it. Well, you know, I said, well, that's what we've got to do. That's, we're duty-bound to do that. That's what the law says. Well, I'll tell him. It's okay. Because they've worked together, too. He goes down, and the next day I get a phone call. Get your butt down here now. I drive to Key West, 60 miles away, and go in the office. Shut the door. That's one of those shut door calls. What the hell are you trying to do? Said, what do you mean? Are you making an accusation against another officer? No, sir, not, not, not at all. He said, why are you dumping this in my lap? I said, because you're the supervisor, that's why. <laughs> and uh, they never caught him, but uh, he owned about 10 rent houses in Panama City. He was doing real well on the cost salary. So the corruption is just everywhere down there. So I quit. I walked in, leave my gun and badge on the table. Said, I'm out of here. Luck would be, I got to Dallas, walked in and talked to the district director there and told him what I had done. Said, do you have any openings? If you want your career service, once you've got the number of years in, you can go anywhere there's an opening. He said, yeah, I have an opening. He said, I'll hire you. So just like that, I got a job. I mean, I never even missed a paycheck. You know? So. Uh, but I had a good reputation, I worked hard. All right. That's our mission statement. Uh, I gotta tell you, I have, I'm married to my wife Nancy for 30 years. I have two daughters, 28 and 26. One of them just got hired for the State Department as a passport investigator. My other daughter's an actress in Fort Worth. And ironically, my oldest daughter couldn't get a job with a master's degree from UCL London. And my youngest daughter got a job with a fine arts degree right off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> but now, and my oldest daughter did two years in Ukraine as a Peace Corps volunteer, which helped her because she learned two more languages. She now speaks five languages, which is really going to help her in the State Department. She didn't ever get me in trouble, what, at all. Uh, didn't date till they were in their 20s. One of them's still not married. One of them just got married last year. Those of you that saw this the night, I always start off with this. Sir Robert Peel, the father of modern policing, he developed ethical principles for thieves from England that clarified the roles and relationship of police and the public they serve. The ability of the police to perform their duties is dependent upon public approval for police actions. This goes back a long time, and every police to this day should be operating on those principles. We at LEAP are, are cops, judges, prosecutors, prison wardens, attorneys. We have over 150,000 members worldwide. And we have uh, speakers in, in 80 countries around the world. We have a branch office in Brazil. We have one in, well, I say a branch office, it's not really a branch. We're elite national is in the United States, and then all the others are in the countries set up with our approval. We approve their bylaws and stuff, but we don't do fundraising for them or decide who they can get their speakers. That's up to them. They're independents, but they're still under the leap umbrella. New, New, uh, New Zealand. Australia, they're just about as big a bunch of rebels as we are in Texas, but they still have our lead brand. Uh, New Zealand's really good. England, uh, the president over there is a lawyer, but he's, he's a former financial investigator of drug crimes. And the lady that runs the European is a former MI5 agent from, uh, from Great Britain that blew the whistle on some illegal murders, and she had to, to leave the force. Uh, Annie Machon, she's a wonderful lady, smart as a whip. Uh, she runs the European Union. We have Canada, run by a police officer, actually a sitting police officer runs the League Canada. And of course the United States. We hope to open, oh, well, Costa Rica, the goddamn, we got one in Costa Rica, and we hope to have one soon in Mexico City. So we're a growing organization. 
Oh, we're also a non-government NGO to the United Nations, which means we have we have consultative status to the UN. We go to the meeting, and what that really means is if you go out and all of the NGOs together unanimously agree to something, they're supposed to vote on it on the floor of the UN, the General Assembly. They don't always do that. So three years ago, they unanimously agreed in the UN and NGOs to establish harm reduction instead of arresting and incarceration. Unanimously came out of the NGOs. They did not vote on it on the General Assembly. I was there and didn't vote on it. We're going back this year. Now we have the step full status and we'll see what we get done. We don't know. It's hard. They don't want to rope themselves out of a job. We're not for drug use. I always tell that. We're actually against it. We have seen, most of us have seen, and to be a speaker you have to work the front lines of the drug war. We've seen the damages it can cause. You can see how it destroys families. But we also see how if someone is busted for a pound of pot and you take them to prison and take their children away from them and put them in foster home, that also destroys the family. So it's, you know, it's a, you're damaged to do and damaged to don't, but I don't want to break up a family over something as basically innocent as the parents smoking pot. We believe in a regulated controlled drug market, along with education and treatment, is far preferable to arrest and incarceration. Now, to have a regulating, to regulate and control anything, it has to be legal. Therefore, we are for legalization of all drugs so we can regulate and control them. We want to take them out of the hands of the drug gang, the criminal cartels, and get the, the crime and violence out of it. From a public <coughs> safety standpoint, narcotics, all drugs, should be handled as a healthy item instead of a criminal justice item. And as I was mentioned earlier, illegal drugs corrupt everything they touch. Mexico, in Mexico, when I was working at the Intelligence Analysis Center in Mexico City at the embassy, 3% of the population in Mexico trusted the police. So great of the day. I have worked cases of cocaine coming up the routes off Mexico into Mexico for further transshipment on the United States that we know the connection went directly to the Mexican White House. So that's how high it's involved in corruption in Mexico. Not the current president, the previous one. In 1998, I'm speaking of 98. I can't attest for it today. And I couldn't even speak of it, but I've been out. I'm not held by the Secret Act anymore. But that's how high it goes. Central America is corrupt all the way across. Ironically, if we, if we wipe out cocaine in the, center, in the Andean rich nations, which they produce about 2 million pounds of blow, it'll still grow in Africa in the same latitude. <coughs> And you think it's corrupt in South America, you try <laughs> Sub-Saharan Africa. This is an SFDP slide. They say our government spends roughly the same amount of money to incarcerate a non-body marijuana user for one year as it does to pay a teacher to educate an entire classroom for the same amount of time. Which has a more positive effect on our society. Well, we know that. Paying the teacher in the classroom would be far preferable to the other one. <coughs> Attorney General Holder is turning out to be very much an activist Attorney General. He's coming around with a lot of things, and there's some more stuff this morning that no, I haven't fleshed it out yet because I haven't got all the reports. But he came out with these comments about, uh, about three months ago. Well over two million people are currently behind bars in this country. And as a nation, we are totally efficient in our incarceration efforts. Like I said before, we incarcerate more people in the United States. 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's prudent in the United States. We incorporate more people than China and <coughs> Russia combined. One in 28 children has a parent in prison. For African American children, the ratio is 1 in 9. Now, it really doesn't matter what you think about minorities, race problems, the home problems, or anything else. But when you can see that that 1 in 9 kid is growing up without a parent in the home, the mother probably having to work two jobs. That's a, a recipe for disaster. That kid's going to get in trouble. <coughs> 700,000 people released in state federal prisons every year, and 9 to 10 million more cited through local jails, and 40% of former federal prisoners, along with more than 60% of former state prisoners, are rearrested or have their supervision revoked in three years. And the reason for that is they drug test them and they're smoking a joint or drinking a beer and they go back to jail. Well, that's totally ridiculous. Rule number one, and I've always maintained this, and I think it should be happening, if you get five years in prison, you do your five years, you walk out, you're a free man. They can't hold it against you anymore. 
and I don't think you ought to have to check a box to get a job. Some exceptions would be different, 